First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning, University Language Centre. How can I help you? I'm interested in doing a language course. I did Mandarin last year, and now I'd like to do Japanese. Can you give me some information about what courses are available at your centre and when they start, that sort of thing? Yes, certainly. Well, we actually offer a number of courses in Japanese at different levels. Are you looking for full-time or part-time? Oh, I couldn't manage full-time as I work every day. But evenings would be fine and certainly preferable to weekends. Well, we don't offer courses at the weekend anyway, but let me run through your options. We have a 12-week intensive course, three hours, three nights a week. That's our crash course. Or an eight-month course, two nights a week. I think the crash course would suit me best as I'll be leaving for Japan in six months' time. Are you a beginner? Not a complete beginner, no. Well, we offer the courses at three levels. Beginners, lower intermediate and upper intermediate, though we don't always run them all. It depends very much on demand. I'd probably be at the lower intermediate level, as I did some Japanese at school, but that was ages ago. Right. Well, the next Level 2 course begins on Monday the 12th of September. There are still some places on that one. Otherwise, you'd have to wait until January or March. No, I'd prefer the next course. The woman asks the man for some details about himself. Look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and complete the form. Right. Can I get some details from you then, so I can send you some information? Sure. What's your name? A family name first. Haggerty. Richard. H-A-G-A-R-T-Y? Uh, no. H-A-G-E-R-T-Y. Oh, OK. And your address, Richard? Well, perhaps you could email it to me. Right. What's your email address? It's ricky45, uh, that's one word, r-i-c-k-y-4-5, at hotmail.com. And I just need some other information for our statistics. This helps us offer the best possible courses and draw up a profile of our students. Fine. What's your date of birth? I was born on the 29th of February, 1980. 1980? So you're a leap year baby. That's unusual. Yes, it is. And just one or two other questions for our market research, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. What are your main reasons for studying Japanese? Business, travel or general interest? My company is sending me to Japan for two years. All right, I'll put down business. And do you have any specific needs? Will there be an emphasis on written language? For instance, will you need to know how to write business letters, that sort of thing? No, but I will need to be able to communicate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. OK, so I'll put down conversation. 
Yes, because I already know something about the writing system at an elementary level, and I don't anticipate having to read too much. You said you'd studied some Japanese. Where did you study? Three years at school.、Uh, then I gave it up, so I've forgotten a fair bit. You know how it is with languages if you don't have the chance to use them. Yes, but I'm sure it will all come back to you once you get going again. Now, once we receive your enrolment form, we'll contact you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a reporter talking on the radio about an artist's exhibition. Look at questions eleven to eighteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to eighteen. And now for some information on local events and activities. A couple of announcements for art lovers and budding artists alike. First, a new collection of artwork is going on show to the public next month in the form of an artist's exhibition. The exhibition will include many different types of art, over a hundred different pieces by fifty-eight artists from the local area. It's being held at the Royal Museum, which, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the area, is located opposite the library in West Street, right on the corner. The actual address is Number One Queen's Park Road. It isn't difficult to find. The exhibition will run for nine weeks and will begin on the sixth of October and continue until the tenth of December. So there's plenty of time for you to go along and have a look, and I'm sure that will be worth doing. What will you see there? Well, amongst the items on display will be some exciting pieces of modern jewellery, furniture, ceramics, metalwork, and sculpture. To give you some examples. Local artist Kate Main will be there to discuss her collection of pots and bowls that she has made to resemble garden vegetables. They're the sort of thing that would brighten up any dining table, and range from things like yellow cabbage-shaped bowls to round tomato-shaped teapots. Prize winner Cynthia Corse will also be there to talk about her silver jewellery, all of which she produced using ideas from the rural setting of her country home. Some of her rings are quite extraordinary and have beautiful coloured stones in them. Or, if you prefer sculpture, there's plenty of that too. Take for example Susan Cup's sculpture of twenty-five pairs of white paper shoes. It sounds easy, but believe me, it looks incredible. All of these items, along with many others, will be on sale throughout the exhibition period. As part of the exhibition, there will be a series of demonstrations called Face to Face, which will take place every Sunday afternoon during the exhibition, and these will provide an opportunity for you to meet the artists. Now look at questions nineteen and twenty.
as the talk continues, answer questions 19 and 20. The second set of activities are for those who would prefer to indulge in some artwork themselves. The Artists' Conservatory are holding a series of courses over the autumn period. The courses cover all media and include subjects such as Chinese brush painting, pencil drawing and silk painting. All the tutors are experienced artists. Course sizes are kept to a minimum of 15 and there will be plenty of individual assistance. All the sessions offer excellent value for money and the opportunity to relax in a delightful rural setting. Fees are very reasonable and include the use of an excellent studio and access to the art shop, which you will find sells everything from paper to CDs, and they also include the provision of all materials. For more information on dates, cost and availability, you should get in touch with the programme coordinator on 4592 839 584 or go direct to the website, which you will find is... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear a student called Tina asking Professor Van Diesen for advice on choosing courses. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, are you Professor Van Diesen? Yes, I am. And who might you be? Oh, sorry, my name is Tina. I'm a freshman here. They told me I should ask you for advice in choosing courses. Well, that's part of what I'm here for. Please come in and sit down. Now, what are your questions? I... I almost don't know. Everything is so confusing. Like, what is a specialized course? Oh, easy. A specialized course is one that is compulsory, meaning it's a requirement for your major and regular, so you can't place out by taking a proficiency exam. That sounds pretty strict. Then what are all these general courses? I seem to have to take so many. Nothing to be alarmed over. These are courses open to all students and not directly related to your major. The university offers these general courses to choose so that you can become more well-rounded individuals. For example, I see you're a microbiology major, so it might be a good idea to take some literature or history courses so that you can know something besides all science. You mean these courses are like for fun? That might be one way to look at it, but don't tell the literature professor such a thing. Think of a general course as the opposite of a specified course. A specified course is one that pertains directly to your major. So, can I take any microbiology course I want? Let's see. Oh, those courses used to be open to microbiology students only. The good thing is, now it's open to students on a flexible schedule so it's not only for full-time students. So the answer is yes, if you have the instructor's permission. May I ask you why you chose microbiology? Well, I also like plain old biology too. You know, full-size animals. I might even become a veterinarian. Could I take some biology classes? Well, they are open to full-time students only, which I believe is what you are. 
I don't know how a freshman would get along with microbiology, though. I mean, most of the students presently looking into it are from off campus. Off campus? Yes, you know, people who use it in their work at hospitals, laboratories, even a police detective. Why did you choose microbiology, if I may ask? I don't think you quite answered that. Well, eventually I want to be a doctor. At least my dad tells me so. If I may say so, young lady, you seem a little uncertain. Still, I think that might be a good idea for a career. Of course, if you're thinking about being either a doctor or a vet, you should take some medical science classes before you even think of applying to med school. Great. What should I take? There is one small problem. The new medical sciences building is under construction, so there are no experimental facilities available until next year. I'm afraid you'll have to wait. But don't forget to take those courses at the first opportunity. Oh, bummer. Is there any other course you'd recommend for someone like me? Well, since you seem to like animals, have you ever thought about looking into environmental science? No, I never really thought about it before. Is it worthwhile? Quite. In fact, it's the fastest growing subject on this campus. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm sorry, I couldn't help noticing the long list of classes you've written out there. May I have a look? Oh, sure. Medical science, statistics, laboratory techniques, medicine, mathematics, computing. My, my, a bit of everything here. Is it too much? For your first semester, yes. What I suggest is starting out by taking the compulsory courses. Like we said before, the medical science can wait. Consider taking that in your sophomore year. I think I'd put off computing, too. I recommend to all freshmen that I talk to to get the compulsory mathematics out of the way as early as possible, so take that one. It'll be one less difficult course you have to focus on when the science lab opens next year, and you have to catch up on classes like laboratory techniques. Your major also requires statistics, so you have to balance two math classes, and no doubt you should take that. Otherwise, get your required medicine course out of the way by taking something theory-based. Oh, of course, and your environmental science class, if you're interested. The others can wait, though I think computing is definitely a good idea, even though it's not required. I see, too, on your paper there, you seem to have had high marks on the entrance exam. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Don't be shy. Have you thought about applying for a scholarship? Do they have any? I mean, my dad is always complaining about how much money it costs him. In your department, there are actually three full scholarships available. They cover tuition and provide $1,500 cash. $1,500 cash? Party! Please, miss, the money is intended more as a textbook allowance, not party money. If you promise to behave, I'll show you how to apply. Great, and thanks. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an extract from a university lecture on the topic of marketing. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Last week we looked at some general principles associated with marketing, and today I'd like to look at some of those points in a little more detail. So, what is marketing? Or put another way, what does the term marketing mean? Many people think of it simply as the process of selling and advertising. And this is hardly surprising when every day we are bombarded with television adverts, mail shots, and telephone sales. But selling and advertising are only two functions of marketing. In fact, marketing, more than any other business function, deals with customers. So perhaps the simplest definition is this one. Marketing is the delivery of customer value and satisfaction at a profit. In other words, finding customers, keeping those customers happy, and making money out of the process. The most basic concept underlying marketing is the concept of human needs. These include basic physical needs for things like food, as well as warmth and safety. And marketers don't invent these needs. They're a basic part of our human makeup. So, besides physical needs, there are also social needs. For instance, the need to belong and to be wanted. And in addition to social needs, we have the need for knowledge and self-expression, often referred to as individual needs. As societies evolve, members of that society start to see things not so much in terms of what they need, but in terms of what they want. And when people have enough money... These wants become demands. Now, it's important for the managers in a company to understand what their customers want if they're going to create effective marketing strategies. So there are various ways of doing this. One way at supermarkets, for instance, is to interview customers while they're doing their shopping. They can be asked about their buying preferences, and then the results of the survey can be analyzed. This provides reliable feedback on which to base future marketing strategies. It's also quite normal for top executives from department stores to spend a day or two each month visiting stores and mixing freely with the public, as if they were ordinary customers, to get an idea of customer behavior. Uh, another way to get information from customers is to give them something. For instance... Some fast food outlets give away vouchers in magazines or on the street that entitle customers to get part of their meal for nothing, as well as being a good way of attracting customers into the restaurants to spend their money. It also allows the managers to get a feel for where to advertise and which age groups to target. Another strategy employed at some well-known theme parks, such as Disneyland, is for top managers to spend at least one day in their career touring the park dressed as Mickey Mouse or some other cartoon character. This provides them with the perfect opportunity to survey the scene and watch the customers without being noticed. Okay, well, we mentioned customer satisfaction at the beginning of this lecture, and I'd like to return briefly to that as it relates to what we've just been talking about. If the performance of a product falls short of the customer's expectations, the buyer is going to be dissatisfied. In other words, if the product you buy isn't as good as you'd expected, then the chances are you'll be unhappy about it. If, on the other hand, performance matches expectations and the product you buy is as good as you expected, then, generally speaking, the buyer is satisfied. But smart companies should aim one step higher they should aim to delight customers by promising only what they can be sure of delivering and then delivering much more than they promised. So then, if, as sometimes happens, performance is better than expected, the buyer is delighted and is twice as likely to come back to the store. Now, let's move on to look at the role of advertising. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.